Hey, and welcome to Connect with Scripture. My name is Jason Hildebrand, and we are thrilled that you have joined us once again this week. We have been trekking through the life of David over the summer and now pushing into the fall. And the reason for that is because uh, our company, Jason Hildebrand Creative Arts, has a number of projects uh, around the life of David. We were working on a film project on the Psalms. We are working on a film project on uh, on the life of David, which we hope to shoot next summer. And so that's just kind of in the heartbeat of our company. And so we're excited to kind of walk with you through that. We also feel like what David has to say, or what we rather what we have to learn from the life of David is really relevant to what's going on in the world today. Um, I think a lot of it has to do for me with what does it mean to be a person after God's own heart uh, and the character behind that and, and the reality of failing but still pursuing God. And so as we do that, uh, why don't you just take a moment? I know in my day, often it's just super crazy busy, so let's just take a moment to stop and breathe. Big breath in and let it go. Just another one. Good, 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 good. Find that uh, to be very helpful in kind of getting me focused and centered and um, moving from the chaos that surrounds me into a place of stillness and connection to myself and to God. And so I, I pray that that would be helpful for you as well. So we're jumping into to 2 Samuel today, and we're actually moving into David's shift from being on the run from Saul for a decade to Saul dying and now David becoming king. And so that's what we're going to go after today. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5, I believe it's verses 1 to 16, and we're going to be reading in for, reading from uh, Eugene Peterson's message translation because it's one of my favorites, uh, the paraphrase. And so here we are, for, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5. Before long, all the tribes of Israel approached David in Hebron and said, Look, look at us, your own flesh and blood. In time past, when Saul was our king, you were the one who really ran the country. Even then, God said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel and become the prince. So all the leaders of Israel met with King David at Hebron, and the king made a treaty with them in the presence of God. And so they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he ruled for 40 years. In Hebron, he ruled Judah for seven and a half years, and in Jerusalem, he ruled all of Israel and Judah for 33 years. David and his men immediately set out for Jerusalem to take on the Jebusites who lived in that country, but they said, you might as well go home. Even the blind and the lame could keep you out. You can't get in here. They had convinced themselves that David couldn't break through. But David went right ahead and captured the fortress of Zion, known ever since as the city of David. And that day, David said, to get the best out of these Jebusites, to get the best out of these Jebusites, one must target the water system. Not to mention this so-called lame and blind bunch that David hates. In fact, he was so sick and tired of it, he coined the expression, no lame and blind allowed in that palace. David made the fortress city his home and named it City of David. He developed the city from the outside terraces inward. David proceeded with a longer stride, a larger embrace of the god of the angel armies, and the god of the angel armies was with him. <laughs> it was at this time that Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David along with timbers of cedar. He also sent carpenters and masons to build a house for David. David took this as a sign that God had confirmed him as king of Israel, giving his kingship world prominence for the sake of his Israel, his people. David took on more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he left Hebron, and more sons and daughters were born to him. 
Well, that's interesting. David kind of uh, becomes king, and the people are like, in, from Judah and Israel, okay, we want you to become king. You were kind of the ruler in general, so why don't you become king? So they anoint him, and he rules for 40 years, which is actually a remarkably long time, considering all the way through the kings, even after David, and uh uh, usually a very short amount of time, but David rules for a long time. He kind of has the golden age of rule before his son Solomon takes over later and then has, well, I guess that's probably called the golden age. So David has the battle age and he has the so the golden age maybe. Um, but he, he, he wastes no time going to where the where he wants to set up his kingdom, and he wipes out those people, and he's just irritated by them. Probably an improper, uh, we wouldn't say that no lame and blind allowed in this palace uh, right now. Uh, that's just politically incorrect. But what, essentially what he's saying is he was calling them that because, I think, because uh, he felt that they were weak, and he didn't want to have any weakness. So he wiped them all out, and he set up his kingdom in this place. And then he he uh, he had such a reputation that kings from other places were sending him uh, wood and gold and stuff, and that starts the the kind of the beginning of his rule. And he takes more concubines, so he's surrounding himself with with more political alliances because a lot of these marriages or concubines were from uh, politically astute families, um, and he kind of sets up his reign. He's kind of setting it up so that he can begin to take over. And in one way, it seems a little bit crazy that he walked in there and he just wiped it all out and sets it up. But that's kind of the way things were done in those days. Uh, and you will see that he's kind of making a platform to begin uh, doing what they suggested, which is kind of like world dominance, which is a little bit strange and wild. And so I guess we'll see how this all shakes down in the coming days. Uh, but right now, David has gone from literally being chased in the wilderness to actually setting things up for success in the future. Um, I find when I read that, I don't quite know what to do with that. It feels a little bit, uh, what's the word for it? Like uh, archaic and uh, ha a lot to do with the strange things that are going on in the world right now. I don't quite know how to wrestle with it, but it's also thousands and thousands of years ago and it's the world that they lived in. And so we have to sit in the complication of what is acceptable in our North American world here today and what was acceptable back then and kind of discern and glean what we can learn from those things without necessarily affirming, yeah, like, that's the thing we need to do. And so uh, I find myself kind of sitting in the middle of that wondering, how do I process this uh, shift in power and how do I process this kind of laying a foundation for a kingdom that will roll out for many, many years to come. Well, thanks for joining in uh, to Connect with Scripture, and uh, we're sure glad you joined us. Please uh, head on over and like and subscribe to our channel, and we look forward to chatting with you next week. Thanks a lot. Bye for now. <laughs>